Father, we thank you for your word. We pray you'd open it to our hearts. We're watching a world around us, Lord, uh, I can't imagine trying to digest news, information, without knowing you. To know that there's a day, an hour, a month, and a year in the book of Revelation where a particular judgment occurs. You are on your timetable. Thank you for warning us of these things. And thank you, Lord, as we continue through, of all things, the priesthood and clothing. You reveal yourself, your nature, and even your power. So I pray that you would bless now the word in this second service and let it not return void, but let it speak to every heart in the room and every heart that's listening let your people be strengthened, we pray, in these very crazy days. In Jesus' name, amen. So, you're right. We're in chapter 27, verse 20, for those who are keeping score. We didn't get to talk about the oil, the anointing oil. And so it says in verse 20, Thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure, that is, zak in the Hebrew, clean or pure, pure olive oil, beaten, that word is kaith. You try it. Kaith. It's only, it's only in the Old Testament, Kaith itself here, particular this verse, five times. Four times translated beaten. One time translated pure. So as you go through, and virtually all the instances dealing with uh, the oil, in the sense, and the oil and the lamp. I, depending on, okay, listen. Depending on who you read and what tour guide you're following, if you're in Israel, or wherever the case may be, or what sites you go to in Israel, you will hear several different opinions as to what exactly do they mean. So I'm going to give you a range of opinions, and then I'm going to choose none of them to leave it absolutely ambiguous for you. That's my job today. But they would harvest the olives, and they would put them in basically burlap sacks. Now, one opinion is they hang the sacks and the olive oil that naturally by gravity basically drips out of the sacks without anything applied to the sack, that is extra virgin olive oil. And that means no intervention has occurred aside from basically gathering and hanging it, and so the oil that comes out is the most pure because it is obtained by basically it coming forth from the olive in and of itself. So that's one description of how you get extra virgin olive oil, the purest in a sense. This case here with kaith, some argue because it's translated pure or beaten, some say no, what happens is they put it in again the sacks and then they hit it, they beat it. They don't crush it, they hit it or they tap it there and they beat it and the oil that comes from that is what they describe then as the extra virgin olive oil. I know you can't wait for the next one. The next one is they take these sacks, this is another version I've heard at a site, and they stack them in their burlap sacks and just the weight of the oil, the olives themselves, the oil that then emanates out from that stack, however many high they may be, that is the extra virgin olive oil. So those are the, some of the main interpretations that you'll often hear as to extra virgin olive oil. It is the least intervention by men to obtain what is viewed as the most pure form of the oil, and that is the oil that would be used for the lighting of the lamps. That is the oil that would be used for the anointing oil and things that they would make. It is the purest form. Everybody got that? Okay. Then they have several other renditions that go along with this, and that is then you take these sacks and you press them, okay, in an olive press. Gethsemane, how many have heard of it, means olive press. So, if you rent a tuxedo for the prom, or you probably hit it, two of them in the back got it, the prom. If you have a place on a hill called olive press, what do you think they grow there? Yeah, otherwise known as the Mount of, see, it all connects. 
It's one of my favorite places to go in Israel. Often if we can, we get for a little period of time a private garden there. Because I honestly think that's where the greatest work was done in redemption. I know we have the cross. I don't, please don't misunderstand me and I'm not preaching heresy. But I think the greatest work of surrender to the Father's will happened there. Jesus, you know, prayed three times. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. It tells us as he's there in this olive press garden, Gethsemane, that he sweat as it were great drops of blood. The stress is such that his capillaries are rupturing and it's working its way out through his pores. That stress of bearing my sin, your sins, the sins of the world, as the Lord would lay on him the iniquity of us all, as it tells us in Isaiah, and that the chastisement of our peace was put upon him. And so Gethsemane for me is a very powerful place because that's where, you know, he could have run. He could have called down, as he told us himself, more than 12 legions of angels. But it's where he surrendered. So God could be just in dismissing your case if you believe. You surrender to Jesus, your record is clean. He surrendered to the Father so he could cleanse your record. Very important place. So the idea of extra virgin olive oil is the purest, however the form is that they use to obtain it, of oil. Hence, clean or pure. Meant to be used only for the most holy purposes. And how many have heard of Zechariah the prophet? Four of you. In Zechariah chapter 4, there the Lord shows Zechariah a vision, or he sees there a menorah. How many know what a menorah is? Great, we've been through it. How many lamps are on the top? I didn't say a Hanuki, I said a menorah. How many? Seven. If you said seven, you're doing well at home. Those keeping score. But what he saw was a lampstand with seven tubes into the seven lamps. And the seven tubes wound up into a bowl. And that bowl was then next to two olive trees. And the two olive trees were dripping the oil into the bowl. And from the bowl, it was distributing through seven pipes and going into the seven individual lamps of the menorah. And so you want to talk about extra virgin olive oil from the very trees themselves was coming this oil that was then fueling this light that was to burn as a light to the nations. And so Zechariah seeing this, chapter 1, you'll find out he's of the priestly line. He knows what is involved in keeping that lamp lit, both to create the fuel and also to maintain it throughout the day. And as he sees these things, the Lord asks him, do you understand what you're seeing, basically? And he said, this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, the priest, or the, the, the governor who was rebuilding the temple, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. So now we have a direct link to the fact that oil, the purest form of oil, olive oil, is a type of God's Holy Spirit. And so the purest work done for the Lord is work that is done in the yielding to God's Holy Spirit. Not crushed by men, not helped by the effort of men, but the purest work of God in your life as a believer and the purest work of God within a ministry is the work where God is allowed to move as he desires to move and to empower as he desires to empower. That's a pure work. Anytime we try to press it, add to it, hype it, whatever, it's less than pure. Now, you might say, well, this is great, but what on earth does this have to do with me and the week I had ahead of me and all that other great stuff? Listen, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he promised to give you the Holy Spirit, yes? He would seal you and dwell in you. And as you step out, he will come upon you and empower you like an anointing oil. If you say, when you wake up, I am not going to do anything offensive to God today. I am going to live that Christian life. Starting now. You won't even get your feet on the floor. 
before you've done something to offend or something that would be something he must judge. Whether you, you did that, you made your decision, you're about to swing out, and the person next to you goes, <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> poof. You failed, you never even got your feet on the ground. Or you go to get on the ground, you go, oh. You failed, you never got your feet on the ground. You see, you can't live the so-called Christian life without the Holy Spirit. You may be sitting here today going, I don't know how to love my husband. You're not alone. But you can't do it without the Holy Spirit. You may be sitting here going, I don't know how to love my wife. You're not alone. You can't do it without the Holy Spirit. I don't know what to do with my kids. You're not alone. Or my grandkids. Or my in-laws. Or the people at work. You're not alone. God never asked you to live a life like Jesus wherever he has placed you in your own strength. What he's asked is that you would let him work through you by the Holy Spirit through his strength to give you the ability to say no to sin, to say no to temptations, to say yes to showing love when you want to show anger, to let him do the work through you. If you'll let him do that. And the only way to really be effective to have that kind of work in your life is to know the word of God. To take the time to read it. Because as you take the time to read it and soak it into your heart, now the Holy Spirit brings to you in the moment what you ought to have done or what you ought not to have done to keep you from going to places that now basically Jesus had to pay to, to cover. That work of the Holy Spirit. Well, past Chris, past Chris, yeah. But there was more in Zechariah 4. You're right. He asked Zechariah, do you understand what these two trees are? And Zechariah wisely said, well, you know. <laughs> it's a good answer if you ever, never mind. And he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand before the Lord or the judge of the earth. Ooh. Okay. Uh, who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? What is his name? Jesus from where? Nazareth. Who is going to rule the nations with a rod of iron whose dominion is an everlasting dominion? He is the rock cut without human hands and all nations will bow before him. Who is it? King Messiah, who is? Jesus. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 9, Revelation 19. He is it. So tell me when the Lord of all the earth ever appeared in a glorified form with two anointed servants next to him. If you said the Mount of Transfiguration, you're right. Jesus went into a high mountain. There he was transfigured, glory shining forth from him, not reflecting from him, brighter than the sun. And there appeared with him two, Moses and Elijah, two prophets. To anointed ones. Moses, the ultimate representation, though, of the law. Elijah, the ultimate representation of the prophets, though Moses also prophesied. And so these two anointed ones. I don't know about you, but as I'm watching the world unfold lately, I'm beginning to get an increased expectation of seeing those two anointed ones again. What are you talking about? Revelation chapter 11. That the Lord is going to send two prophets. They will prophesy 1,260 days. You know that is three and a half years. When they complete their work of prophecy, the Antichrist will attack them, kill them, leave them the streets of Jerusalem three and a half days, it's reported, and then they will resurrect bodily. The whole world will see this and they'll send back into heaven. Now the question is, who are the two prophets? Well, in Revelation 11, it tells us here are the things they do. One, they can call down fire upon their enemies. Name a prophet who did that. Elijah. They withhold rain for three and a half years. Name a prophet who did that. Elijah. And they have the ability to inflict the earth with plagues and turn water to blood. Name one who did that. Moses. Yeah, but Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris. Yeah. I heard it's got to be Elijah and Enoch. All right, why? 
Well, because Elijah was taken up in a chariot there, the whirlwind, fire chariot, and, and all that. And Enoch uh, walked with the Lord, and he was gone. The Lord translated him. And as you know from Hebrews 9, it's appointed once for a man to die, then comes the judgment. So they need to come down here and take it like men. Uh, wait a second. Behold, I show you a mystery. We will not all sleep or die, but we will all be changed when? In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, this corruption will put on incorruption. This mortal will put on immortality. The dead in Christ rise first. We are alive, remain caught up suddenly to be with them in the clouds. And so if we, those who of us who are raptured, get to be changed from subject to death to deathlessness without dying, why don't they get a pass? I hadn't thought of it. Try it on. So I'm going to stick with it's Moses and Elijah. That's why the Jews at Passover always put an open chair. It is for Elijah. Because in Malachi 4, 5, they were told, behold, Elijah the prophet will come to you before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So this work of God through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he desires to do it in your life. But you will not understand what he would have you to do if you don't understand what he has said to you through his word. That's why we go chapter by chapter and verse by verse. If you would just read it, your life will change. Which is why Satan wants you to do anything but read it. Because he loves it when people claim Jesus, but their lives really haven't changed. So just a reminder, I know we've got to get through chapter 28, and I've got a really cool article, and we've got to keep moving. So just, now you know. So you can go home and decide if it's extra virgin, hanging in the sack, beaten with a stick, pressed in bags. You can go home and work on all of it, but you get extra virgin, virgin, you get olive oil, and then you get basically fuel grade, you know, sort of commercial use oil after that for lubricants and other things. And, but I'll let you have fun with that one. And, You'll find lots of opinions. So anyway, pure olive oil, beaten for the light, to cause the lamp to burn always. God lit the fire, they were to keep it burning. Boy, that's an interesting thought. We're to keep it burning. In the tabernacle of the congregation without the veil, so before the Ark of the Covenant, before the veil and the Holy of Holies, it's there, and you know it's on the south side to the left, you already knew that which is before the testimony, Aaron and his son shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord. It should be a statute forever unto their generations on behalf of the children of the Lord. Name a famous prophet who was called as the lamp was going out. Samuel. The Lord Samuel. He comes to Eli. Listen, he says it again. Say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. It's a reflection on Eli's stewardship as high priest. First Samuel. See, if you're not sure what to do this week, now you got first Samuel. But that's how he was called. Something that was supposed to be kept burning was going out. That was quite the sense of epitome of what was happening at the nation. Keep it burning. So chapter 28, after all, we've got to show you something here today and get through our chapter and work on it. Chapter 28, Exodus. I don't think you can see this. If you can, your contacts work. If you can't, ah, there we go. But it helps me to know what book I'm in, what chapter. Take unto thee Aaron thy brethren <clears throat> and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may, now how many of you are surprised, how many of you would have thought, you know, the natural order would have been make Moses the high priest? How many, am I the, like, well, why not just, I mean, Moses right there. I mean, think about, you know, internship, um, residency, you know, all that. I mean, Moses has got way more practical experience in interacting with God, understanding God, revealing himself, and all that. And, and yet, God skips over Moses and goes to Aaron. Naturally, because he's such an illustrious example of human beings. Well, I'll show you that in a minute. So Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, God calls, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Even Aaron, meaning light bringer. Nadab, which is generous. Abihu, or we would be Abihu. He is my father. Eliezer, Eleazar, God has helped. And Ithamar, which is coast of palms, Aaron's son. So, light bringer who's generous, he is my father, God has helped in the land of palms. Interesting progression. 
Now I know what you're thinking. Well, wait a second. This guy, Aaron, completely blows it. I know, just a few pages. Good, turn there, chapter 32. Chapter 32, Moses, still up receiving these things from the Lord, being shown the originals. People come to Aaron, they're like, what happened to Moses? Make us a god. He asked for gold. <laughs> Love this explanation. Chapter 20, uh, sorry, 32, verse 21, Moses comes down. This whole thing's happening. We'll get there soon. He says, what did this people do to you that you brought so great a sin upon them? This is Aaron, future high priest. And he said, oh, let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. You know the people that they're set on mischief through the people under the bus. <coughs> All the people are dancing around, caught up in this naked, for Aaron made them naked. And his answer was, I threw a little gold in the fire, and poof, out popped this thing. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce you to your future high priest, Aaron. Well, that's not his only illustrious moment. Turn to Numbers 12. There's another one of the, I'm so glad God does, at least I don't think has recorded my, my mess ups and hopefully your mess ups and Chapter 12, Numbers, now Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman, Ethiopian women, by the way, known for their beauty. And they said, <clears throat> while well, talking behind his back, hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? Uh-oh, the Lord heard it. You know, he hears your gossip too. And he called them out, and some very important things happened, but you can read that later, too. So they got two things to read, Samuel and that one. Then turn to Leviticus 10. So Moses, caught in backbiting and gossip and slander, questioning the authority, uh, sorry, Aaron, caught up in gossiping, backbiting and slander of Moses, caught up uh, basically questioning the authority above him, and getting the whole golden calf thing where the people ended up naked and then after that judged. Then we get chapter 10. See, in Leviticus, and this is where they actually built the thing we're learning about and got it all ready for service and sacrifice. And then the Lord brought fire from heaven, lit the altar, started the whole system off. God lights the fire. You keep it burning. We'll get through that as they travel, how they did that. And while this is all happening, Nadab and Abihu, second and third in our list, the sons of Aaron, they took each of them his censer. Think the thing that swings on a chain smokes with the incense. They took each of them their censer, put fire then in, therein, put incense therein, and offered strange fire. Now, that means whatever fire they introduced was foreign to the fire that had been used to start the system. Something kindled by man. In other words, work of men. They offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord somehow in the tabernacle and devoured them. Whoa. They died before the Lord. In fact, then they, verse 5, went and picked them up, took their coats, so even though they were devoured by fire, their garments survived. And then we're told in verse 9, you shall not drink wine nor strong drink, nor you nor your sons with you when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die. So apparently Nadab and Bihu, getting caught up in the moment, had decided, it appears to be, get inebriated, and then basically kind of do things their way. And how did that work out? These are the first three in the list. Now, I know what you're thinking. They're complete screw-ups. Yep. And God used them? Aaron, for sure. Nadab and Abihu, shortly. Wait a second. So if God will use people like that, then God can use you. People say, well, God can't use me. I'm like, well, have you ever helped murder Christians? Why, no. Well, you're ahead of Paul. You ever get a whole congregation dance around naked and then get judged? Uh, no. Well, then you're ahead of, uh, you know, Aaron. Well, I hadn't thought of it that way. Well, I don't encourage you to try it, but I'm just saying, <laughs> if God can use them. See, people say, well, boy, I hear these needs in Sunday school, Wednesday night, Awana, but, you know, I mean, I, 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 I just, I mean, I'm not as spiritual as the people on either side of me. God will work anyway if you let him. He's just looking for people he can use. Back to him, if you do it through the Holy Spirit, God will do things you never dreamed. 
but you've got to be willing to step up. So just a little encouragement. These are the kind of people God worked with, and you're reading about them. Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And you shall make, aha, here we go again, the tabernacle. This is all part of it. Holy garments for Aaron, thy brother. Now here's one rendition in this picture, but this one's easier to work from. <clears throat> you shall make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, for glory, kabod. Try it. What does ikabod mean? Glory departed. That's also in 1 Samuel. You'll run into it. No, you know what it means. For glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all the wise hearted, whom I have filled, male, to fill, filled with the spirit of wisdom. Note that work of the spirit. And you'll see in a minute as I go through these descriptions, can you imagine doing this without a pattern, without a picture, with just hearing Moses? You're going to need the spirit of wisdom from God. That they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him to, again, basically, sanctify him, to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. These are the garments which thou shalt make, or they shall make. A breastplate, that's the square thing here with jewels on it for those at home. Breastplate, okay, also called the kosen. Breastplate, wonderful. An ephod, the ephod technically is what's up here in the shoulders and connects in some fashion through the back. This one, they do it as a long kind of apron thing. I'll show you a few variations. But the key thing is it has four points upon which that breastplate can connect. Ephod, kind of like a mantle in a sense. A robe, that is the blue one here, that is the robe. And also a broidered coat, many argue one that goes over top of this for weather issues. Uh, there are some versions you'll see out there as you search, but that's at least one of the opinions, broidered coat or robe. A mitre, and it's the hat going over the top, of course, obviously wearing a tunic here. Mitre, or the bonnet, or the hat, and a girdle. Now look, before you think Playtex and grandma stuff that showed up in the laundry as a kid, that's sash. It goes about the sense, it gird, girds, it goes around the core of the body, girdle, not what you're thinking that, anyway, girdle, sash, just trying to keep it real. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother. Yeah, never mind. Holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, and his sons, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And they shall take gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine linen, not wool, linen. We, in chapter 39, if we went through, it's virtually the same account of what we're reading here. The only difference is we learned that the gold thread, they hammered gold in the plates, trimmed it into wires, and then wove it in. So that's one detail that I mentioned here that is in the construction. That's where the golden thread came from. And so they shall take gold, blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen. In fact, uh, here's one version again of an ephod. There's another version of the ephod. This one just to the shoulders and very not back near the back. And then, of course, the sash or the girdle. This one is an actual garment in Israel. Um, why would they make an actual garment for a high priest in Israel? What are they, back to the tux for the prom thing, what are they expecting? Yeah, I got an article about that, but we'll, uh... so here they are making, and this is the templeinstitute.org, this is where I grabbed it from, they have made the garments for the high priest, which then helps us to interpret what we're reading based on their opinion, and they did a lot of research. Okay, so fine twine linen, gold, blue, purple, scarlet, fine twined, here you go. Next, you shall have, Rich, of two shoulder pieces, verse 7, joined at the two edges thereof, and so shall it be joined together. And the curious girdle, think again, ingenious, sort of embroidered, you know, the idea sash, of the ephod, which is upon it, shall be of the same, according to the work thereof, even of gold, blue, purple, scarlet, fine twined linen. And thou shalt take two onyx stones. Here you go. Two onyx stones. The names of the children of Israel shall you grave on them. Six of the names on the one stone, and on the other six names, the rest on the other stone, according to their birth. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, shalt thou engrave the two stones. With the names of the children of Israel, thou shalt make them to be set in ooches of gold. What's an ooch? There you go. We would call it a setting. So now if you're out and about today going to Sunday brunch, you see someone who's out there and they're wearing a brooch, you can say, nice ooch. <laughs> right? 
Don't tell them who told you to do that, but it's the setting. Also an interesting thought, six on one side, six on the other side. We went through this before, a six day man created the weight of man on his shoulders, the weight of the men of Israel on his shoulders. Huh. So it should be like the working of an engraver. You shall engrave the names in the two stones. And shall put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod for stones for a memorial unto the children of Israel. So here we go back to our real garment that is sitting there in Israel. And these things go on the shoulders, hence the red circles. That's the uches with the onyx stones on the shoulders of the ephod. Wonderful. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. Every time he comes in before the Lord, obviously just normally once a day into the Holy of Holies, Yom Kippur, he's bearing the nation. How many have read or have heard of the book of Job? How many would like to be Job? Never a hand. In Job chapter 1, verse 5, I believe, you'll find there where each day Job would offer a sacrifice, a burnt offering or sacrifice for each of his children, each of them individually. Lest, said Job, they inadvertently cursed God in their heart or somehow be an offense to God. If you have not had the opportunity to be a parent in some fashion, you don't really understand. But once you become a parent, you really begin to learn you need to pray for your kids. And you may think, well, you know, once I leave the house, I don't have to worry about it anymore. Oh, no, no, actually, you start praying more sometimes than you did when they were kids. Whether you're a dad or a mom, you are essentially, much like Aaron here, a priest in your home. He bore the names of the children of Israel before the Lord. He bore the burdens of the children of Israel before the Lord. And then he would then come back and subsequently bear the word of God back to the children of Israel on behalf of the Lord. Hence the term, a mediator. If you say, well, I don't know how to pray. It's simple. It's talking to God. You talk to him about what's going on. That, well, I, don't, I can't pray very long. How many kids do you have? Five? Well, I can tell you you're going to have at least five minutes. Plus your spouse plus your grandkids, asking God to be with them, asking God to reveal himself to them, asking God to draw them to himself, asking God to work in their lives and to bless them, asking God if they've strayed away to surround them with men and women they respect who love Jesus, to call them back. I've got parents who sit in the first service who spend a lot of time praying, and their kids now often come to the third service, because they have small ones now. They're not only back in church, they're bringing their grandkids, or their kids as the case may be, because those parents didn't stop bearing their children's names before the Lord when they wandered away. You see, God has an entire planet full of prodigals who have strayed from him. He understands when your heart's broken because your child, your son or your daughter, are going in a direction that greatly concerns you. Your job is to bring them before the Lord in prayer. And he'll hear you. So Aaron is to wear these two shoulder pieces as part of his work in the ministry of bearing the children of Israel before the Lord. And so thou shalt make the uches of gold, verse 14, two chains of pure gold at the ends of wreathen work shalt thou make them and fasten them, the wreathen chains to the uches. You can see the uches here with the chains as depicted in our picture. Now, is this not helpful to have the picture? Yeah. Could you imagine being the guys going, you want an ooch, you want golden chains, and the ephod, the way it's four square, but it, got it, uh-huh. No wonder they needed the spirit. Two chains of pure worth and work, shall you make them, verse 15, you shall make the breastplate of judgment with the cunning work, same weaving, after the work of the ephod, shall thou make it of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet, fine twine linen, shalt thou make it. Four square, it shall be, being doubled, a span shall be the length thereof, and a span shall be the breadth thereof. Show me a span with between thumb and pinky. And once again, if you haven't tried this at home, your span is half your cupid. Oh, yes, finger to elbow. Nine inches, roughly. 18-inch cupid, most people. 
It is to be a nine inch square, okay? What do you see here? A span, what is it? A square, but it said it's folded, which means it is constructed as a cupid long and a span wide, and then it is folded over, and you now know a cupid folded in half gets you a span. In other words, you're making a pouch. Okay, four square, being the length thereof, and the span shall be the breadth thereof. And thou shalt set in it the settings of stone, even four rows of stones, as you see here on this, this outfit. Four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardis, topaz, carbuncle, shall be in the first row. The second row shall be an emerald, sapphire, a diamond. Third row, a ligure, an agate, an amethyst. Fourth row, a barrel, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold in their enclosing. So they get ooched as well. Now, here's a close-up. Here are the numbers. Well, you always realize you have to go from right to left in this case. So you have a ruby, counting one through 12 here. Ruby, jade, agate, carbuncle, lapis lazuli, lazuli uh, quartz, crystal, turquoise, amethyst, agate, aquamarine, onyx, and opal. That is what they've put on this garment we see sewn. These guys have done the research, so the color of the stones apparently should be correct as to the different 12 tribes and their order mentioned here. Wow. And the stones shall be the names of the 12 children of Israel, according to, according to their names, like the engravings of a signet. Every one with his name shall they be according to the 12 tribes. And they shall make upon the breastplate chains at the ends of wreath and work of pure gold. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate two rings of gold, and shall put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. Let's back up and see it again. These guys, they're the rings. And two other ends of the two wreathen chains, and the two shalt thou fasten in the two ooches, those guys, up on the shoulder, the pieces of the ephod before it. And thou shalt make two rings of gold, and thou shalt put them upon the two ends of the breastplate and the border thereof, which is on the side of the ephod inward. And two other rings of gold thou shalt make, and shalt put them on the two sides of the ephod underneath. These two, one is visible. The other one is implied. These rings connect to these rings, etc. And you shall bind, verse 28, the breastplate by the rings thereof under the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue, that it may be above the curious girdle of the ephod and that the breastplate be not loosened from the ephod. Okay, so you now have a pop quiz. Note that's blue, yes? Okay, for those who can see it. This is a wreath and chain. Yes? Good. Let's look at some other versions. Okay, here's an ephod that is just basically straps. Note that, it connecting down here to the curious girdle. Uh, this one, they've got gold and blue. That's correct. Okay, fine. Here's another one. And Oh, that's gold. What color should it be? Blue. See, now you can... Never mind. Move on. Okay, fine. Here are the priests, their garments of linen with their sashes that they receive. Great. Oh, 2018. You know, COVID messed a lot of things up and slowed a lot of things down. But in 2018, March 27th, they did a mock run-through or reenactment of a Passover sacrifice. And if you can see this little round dome, that is the dome of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Not the golden dome of the rock, the southern one the Al-Aqsa Mosque. So if you've been with us to Israel, this is the Davidson Center, the corner here where those stones were thrown down and the shopping area is here. You go through these arches and take a left, you're on the southern steps of the temple mount. And they did a run through just outside the southwestern wall in 2018. They brought their priests who washed their hands and their feet wearing the linen we expect to see, priestly robes. They had their priests standing here, barefooted, as we have seen depicted elsewhere, because the place where they stand is holy ground. There are no shoes for them. Here, you remember the altar and the pouring out of the blood by the altar and the obtaining of blood by slitting the neck and hanging the animals and all that stuff. Here, you have them pouring out blood, a blood of a lamb, on the corner of a mock-up of the altar. This is right on the outside of the Temple Mount 2018. And they were building momentum, and then COVID hit. 
Here's a bonus question. What does this square block supposedly trying to represent? One of the four horns of the altar. Oh, wait a second, Pastor Crystal. You're telling me these guys have priestly garments already made. They're wearing them. You're telling me these guys have got the implements ready to go through and do the sacrifices. They're using them. What are you telling me? Oh, man. That's why I want to share this with you. But we're out of time. So we're going to have to get it next week. Hey, I tried to get as far as I could, but who knew? Let's stand and let's pray. I really didn't try to do it on purpose. I studied the whole chapter, honest. Father, we thank you for your word. Man, oh man, oh man. Is there an expectancy in our hearts as we're watching the world? More than ever, the people out there need to see that people in here have been with Jesus. So please call them to your word. Call them to pray. Lord, draw them. And then fill your church with the power of the Holy Spirit to live God their lives, to be different from the people around them, to be changed. That would give these people a reason to ask them the hope they have within them. Lord, I do lift up anyone that doesn't know you. Right here, right now, would you please open their eyes, draw them in their heart, give them the faith to believe, and let them leave this place having finally received your offering of salvation because they realize you were wearing their sin in the garden and on the cross. And you'll hand to them your righteousness if they'll put their trust in you. Thank you for an amazing book. Thank you that it has spoken to every generation that's humbled itself before it with an open heart. And thank you, Lord, heaven and earth's going to pass away, but your word will not pass away. So even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.